Hello and welcome to today's edition of Extraordinary Outcomes. I'm Shubhanjan Sarkar, your host and founder of Pitchlink, the buyer-seller engagement platform. Today we bring you the fifth installment of the eight-part limited series, Fixing the 5% Problem in B2B Sales. In this limited series, we bring you engaging discussions with experts from around the world on the elephant in the sales room, the abysmally low rate of conversion in B2B sales. Today, we speak with Art Fromm, founder Team Sales Development, Amy Franco, founder and CEO of Amy Franco Associates, and George Brunton, founder of Membrane. Meet Art Fromm, founder of Team Sales Development Incorporated. Art is a sales transformation consultant with a wealth of consultative sales training and development expertise based on over 20 years of industry and sales experience. He began in engineering and quickly moved into various sales positions where he routinely surpassed revenue and performance targets and led sales teams. Art moved into sales enablement role in 2000, responsible for development of 450 sales execs and partners worldwide, eventually founding his own company, Team Sales Development, in 2004. Art developed the Web Mastery series and has successfully helped sales teams and trainers at companies including Cisco, Nokia, DBS Bank, Palo Alto Networks, and Informatica. He is credited with delivering a spectacular increase of almost $1 billion of bookings for a multinational electronics manufacturing outsourcer. Art holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, a Project Management Certificate from University of Alabama, has studied adult learning principles and training development through Fryzen K and Associates, and is Cisco CSE and BAICP certified. Meet Art from. Art, welcome to the show. Uh, I'm delighted to have you and thank you very much for making time right in the morning. We are going to talk about this elephant in the room, which I believe we, we don't like to have a public discourse on this, and, but I think it's time. The fact is that the conversion lead to conversion rate in B2B sales is abysmally low. Mm -hmm. So Art, my question to you, how did we get here? I think the how we got here is I think it's just because traditionally a lot of sales, you know, used to be maybe more B to C. Um, there wasn't all this B to B opportunities like there is now with SaaS and so many other offerings. And so I just feel like the the old adage about, you know, go out and find as many as you can and work on as many as you can. And then we've all heard the numbers of, you know, whatever, 138 or whatever, where you need all of these to get these. And the problem with that is to get more of actual conversions, you gotta put more in the top of the funnel. And unfortunately that means just more work and more effort. And yeah, we could add more people to do more calls, but the question is, is that helpful? And going back way, way back, think about the fuller brush sales person as we had in the US. This is a person that went door to door and had a pack full of things that were commonly needed and would show up and say, do you want one of these? Do you want one of these? Do you want one of these? And they had to go to house after house after house after house. And at the end of the day, if they did maybe 10 sales visiting, I don't know what, 100, 150 houses, they were happy with that. Um, the, the, again, the problem with that, it just leads now to buyer um, fatigue, salesperson fatigue, and, and, a, and a tremendous, you know, misappropriation of resources and frustration. So I think that the key is thinking about what it is that is different now that can be done differently that helps the buyer, helps the person on the other end of the phone, while at the same time helps us as the sales person to determine what we can do about that 5% or whatever you want to call that. Um, so the one thing is, is that thinking about in terms of that funnel and what goes in at the beginning, being able to sort that through a little bit. And one of the things that I've worked with some others on is really thinking about what's the strategy of your company? Where are you trying to go? What are you trying to do? And identify what those buyers look like in terms of something that aligns more to where you really want to take people. And uh, one, of the, one of the approaches that we've used is part of my portfolio is Great Demo. And Great Demo is a methodology really for how to demonstrate mainly software solutions but it starts with the customer in mind and it puts the last thing first. So whatever your main point is, you put right up front. Um, if you're able to do discovery, that's pretty easy to do because you could find out what they care about. The challenge with 
the 5% problem is we don't know necessarily much about them, but here's what we do know. We know their job title, most likely. We know their industry. We probably have a good idea about people like that we've worked with before and what they th are thinking and what they care about. So what we advocate and something to consider is what we call vision generation. So with vision generation, what you do is you put a scenario up without even talking about us first at all. We don't talk about ourselves. Put a scenario up that says, hey, you know, my understanding is that you're the, you know, project manager in charge of this or you're the factory floor person in charge of this. When we've worked with others like you, they have said this is the challenge they have. They have said these are the things that are getting in the way of achieving their goals. They have said these are the things that they are looking for in terms of a solution. And what I like about that approach is we are helping them to see a third perspective of somebody else and what somebody else is doing that we have worked with. We don't even talk about our solution yet. We start with giving them a little bit in order to get. And what that does is it creates some credibility for us in terms of, hey, this is a person I might want to listen to because it sounds like they know my competitor. They know others just like me. And what can they give to me to help me out? Ironically, I find that, you know, and all due respect to marketing, and I know it's getting better, many times I see a lot of feature function stuff. It's all about us. It's all about our product. Maybe a little bit about what it does. What's missing is how does it help the customer? So the question is, how do you see we can actually, as organizations, have a 10 or 15 person conversion? So the funnel, for me, the idea is, the funnel should not be all the way through the sales process to the end. The funnel needs to be right at the top. Funnel at the top, then develop a pipeline of most likely things that could close. So part of the problem, I think, is there's a tendency, um, and I know, you know, I was the salesperson too, is that I would want to chase everything because it's like, oh, you never know what deal might land. So you tend to want to chase everything. But that's the traditional funnel of putting more stuff in the top to get more out of the bottom. But your percentage of closing is still the same. It's just maybe more volume. Uh, on the other hand, though, I've got a lot more work to do up front, which is not efficient. So what can we do to, to neck that funnel down more quickly at the top so that it becomes a pipeline of more likely deals to close? What could we do without actually showing our talking about ourselves, but what can we show up front that would help to neck that funnel down so that we can find people that are most aligned? And I think it starts with what is your strategy and who are you going after? You know, what is your best fit? We shouldn't chase after everything. What do we want to say as in? What do we want to say as out? Um, I know one customer I was working with, they spent something like nine months and $2 million chasing after a deal that wound up being the wrong deal. And so they wasted all that money, all that opportunity cost, wasted the, the time of the customer. Of course, this was further down in, but the point is they didn't do a good job up front of eliminating that as a customer they shouldn't chase, right? So what can we do to align with our strategy up front that helps guide us? Secondly is what can we offer that gets some idea of what we can do from their perspective, gets their buy-in and curiosity so that they want it so that they're like, ooh, that looks interesting to me. I like that. Um, and I think that that's where we can offer up some of what our experience is working with others. Um, case studies and customer success stories on the website are intended to do that. I don't think people have time to read through that all the time. And surprisingly, everybody, here's something that you could do. Go on your website, and if you're in marketing, take a look. Go on your website and see what are these success stories really saying. Who is it about? Is it about the customer and what they were able to do? Or is it more about what you did? So thinking about what's in it for them, even in that funnel part and CSRs and BDRs, what are you going to bring to them? So what have we done that, that we see, not what we've done? Who have we worked with similar to you that's going through this? And now when we offer it up at that funnel part where we start to look at getting it into a pipeline, let's do a little pre-qualification right there. If the person looks at it and says, that's not me at all. No, I don't. That's not what I do. Okay. Now we can have a discussion, right? Now we're going to get into some discovery. What's the same? What's different? If there's no match at all, thank you for your time. We respect that. 
you know, hope you could find a solution or even recommend them to somebody else. If it looks like there's a match, we start doing discovery, we start to document it, it starts to look like it's going into that pipeline that's more qualified, something that's more aligned. It's sales qualified lead, right? That's something we talk about. If we could get a sales qualified lead where it looks like it's aligned with us and aligned with what they need now, and they're pulling instead of us pushing, now we have a much higher likelihood of that closing. So what do you say is a way to do this sieving, this sifting through the through the pile to find the ones which mm-hmm. should go into the pipeline legitimately? Mm-hmm. How do you do that? So if we've done just that little bit of homework and a mindset around what are they going through that I can talk with them about and not say to them, are you doing this? Is this something you're doing? Because people could become defensive, right? Now, how do we know which things we should be saying about this third party? It goes back to what does a well-qualified prospect look like for us? What are the things that would be aligned with where we want to go? So we say, others like you've said, these are their struggles. This is what they're trying to do. This is what they would like. If they had a magic wand, here's the things they would like. How does that sound? How does that compare to your situation? And at that point, we can start to have a discussion. They could say, hey, my challenge sounds exactly the same, but I'm looking at solving it a little bit different way. And they may even ask, is that something you can help me with? Because we've just told them we've worked with others like you. And in fact, if we've done it correctly, we should be able to plant some ideas, not ideas about our product, but ideas about what the possibilities are and what the things are that they should be looking at. I'll tell you one thing that 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 approach does is it's uh, everybody knows about FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. When we start talking about what others are doing and give them ideas they hadn't thought of, it's like, ooh, others are doing that. I probably should be doing that too, right? And either it will confirm where they're at in, in their analysis and they go, okay, I'm on track and these people feel like there's somebody that can help me or, oh my gosh, I'm this far down and I hadn't thought about that. I better go seek them out and see what it is that they have to do. And by the way, one thing that I found interesting is sometimes when you graciously let them go, they start to realize how serious you are and they may even come back and go, well, uh, actually, you know, we really do want to talk to you <laughs> because they, sure. they may go and do their homework and figure out, ooh, what, what, what they were telling me actually was pretty good stuff. I better call them back. Yeah, and it's also a, a great way to build trust, right? When you can tell a customer mm-hmm. that or a prospect that I don't think I can help you, uh, or or this is not exact fit for you, and you you are better off with something else. Mm-hmm. You have actually elevated yourself in the trust quotient in their eyes. That's right. Right. Yeah. That's that's what made a name for Macy's back in the day, right? They right. they would if they didn't have the product, they would recommend it to somebody else, and yet their business grew and grew and grew. It also, by the way, you know what's the interesting about that is, if it doesn't fit with me, why would I want to struggle to make it work? Let's let somebody else take it, especially if it's business I don't really want to do. I'd rather give it to my competitor, and then they can be busy doing that other stuff where I stick to what my my main focus is. Absolutely. Art, this was a very enlightening and educative uh, conversation. I really appreciate the time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Art. Uh, I, I Again, thank you very much for, for coming on the show, and I hope to talk to you again sometime soon. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Good selling, everybody. Our next guest is Amy Franco, the founder and CEO of Amy Franco Associates. With over 20 years of client-facing sales experience, Amy's career includes sales roles with global companies IBM and Lenovo before pivoting into entrepreneurship. Today, her firm works with mid-market technology and professional services organizations to grow sales results through both sales strategy and skill development programs. Her book, The Modern Seller, is an Amazon bestseller and was named a top sales book by Top Sales World. She is also recognized by LinkedIn as a top sales voice. Here is Amy Franco on the five person problem. Amy, welcome to the show. I'm delighted to have you here and thank you so much for joining me this morning. 
So Banjan, I was really looking forward to this conversation. So it's great to be here and uh, thank you for having me. So let's talk about this elephant in the room, which uh, we basically don't like to talk about. And although I'll mention a 5% figure, we don't have to believe that number. But the fact is that lead to conversion in B2B sales is an abysmally low single digit number. Yeah. My question to you, Amy, to start this discussion is, what got us here? We could probably categorize it into two big reasons why. There are the strategic reasons why and the tactical reasons why. I see the strategic reasons why as um, too much turnover in sales leadership roles. I also see it as the highest levels of leadership in an organization, maybe not having a clear enough understanding of sales and the importance of sales in the organization. And you have you have a sales culture problem. Organizations either don't have a sales culture or they're building the wrong sales culture. And what that does is it dovetails into the tactical problems that organizations see. So everything that you just said, conversions, lead conversions being low, close rates being low, the tactical skill development pieces aren't happening. So when you combine, when you look at your organization strategically, you have to really honestly assess if you have the right sales culture and the right people, and then tactically assess, do I have the right people in the right roles with the right skills? And what, one, of the, one of the services that I've added to my organization over the last uh, three months is uh, Salesforce evaluation and assessment. Hmm. And what I am learning from that is many organizations don't use a data-driven approach to hiring and skill development. So many times they might be hiring the wrong sales leader into the role because they don't quite know what they're looking for, or they put someone in the role that they that they like or is not equipped to be a leader. I can talk to a large organization or a small organization, and they tend to have similar problems with the turnover in sales leadership roles. Um, when I look at LinkedIn profiles for some late sales leaders, I, I see them turning over literally mm. every two to maybe four years. Yes. So it's a it's a habit that I think needs to be uh, it needs to be broken at the individual level and fixed at the individual level. But the organization also needs to make a concerted effort to say we want to keep leaders in these roles longer because the more sustainability you have in those roles with the right people, the more success you'll create. So, so for our sales leaders and sales professionals that are watching or listening to this, think about if this has ever happened to you. <laughs> you get to the fourth quarter of the year and you are close to making your number and you are looking at all of your deals in the pipeline and your organization says, we sell on value. We are consultative sellers. We don't sell on price. But you're sitting in the fourth quarter, you've got to get to a number, right? And you're just short of that number. So your product team, your sales team, your pricing team, whatever that is, gives you a whole bunch of incentives to pull deals in to the fourth quarter because it's going to help push you over the finish line. But those deals are going to erode your margins, that is a that's a very tactical example of a culture that says, on one hand, we value uh, high value selling, consultative selling. But on the other hand, we got to pull some deals in and we're, we're going to we're going to uh, erode our margins to do so. And now you've set yourself up for challenges in the future with that customer, because now you've lowered the bar in terms of pricing and deals, and you're training them how to treat you in the future. Absolutely. So, so that, that's, a, that's a very tactical example of where culture and those strategic decisions impact individual deals and individual successes of your rep. Do the marketing leaders and the sales leaders, do they have a good relationship? And are they talking together about what is most important for the organization? Um, then I would say at a maybe a lower level of the organization as a sales professional, do you have natural curiosity about what is happening in the marketing area of the organization? 
Have you taken the time to understand what marketing's processes are? Have they taken the time to understand what your processes are? And, and I'll, I'll give you a quick example to, to maybe bring this together. I recently worked with a client that's uh, in the manufacturing space. And uh, we were doing some, uh, we're, and we still are, some sales strategy work and some sales skill development work. And they had the brilliant idea. Uh, I give them all the credit for this. They had the brilliant idea of including their marketing team in the sales training that we were doing. So we had the group of sellers and we had the group of marketers. And what was so fantastic about that is that the marketers got to hear the challenges that the sales team were facing and how they approach things and to learn about the customers. And the sales team got to hear about the different initiatives that marketing was working on and, and how they can interact better together. And they build better relationships together because of it. So, so that's an example of where marketing and sales is coming together and could start to see some good synergies and outcomes. What do you think can fix this? If, if I'm a sales leader in an organization, I want to know, I, you want to know the brutal truth about what your current situation looks like. So how good is your data? So you want to know what the situation looks like. So without that knowledge, it's really hard to put anything in place to fix it, right? So, so that's where I would be starting. Um, I would also be uh, looking at the, what data can I understand about the sales performance of my team, the competencies of my team? Do I understand what their strengths and weaknesses are? Do I have the right people in the right roles for where I want to go into the future? So I have some choices to make as a leader, and my team has some choices to make as well. So I think my approach in that scenario would be to go to my team and have them bring their, or I'd go into the CRM and pull the data, ideally, if it's good data. But what are the top five deals that you could get done this year that would help us get to this number? As a leader, it's like you got to bring people with you. That your, your team wants to help you be successful if you have a good relationship with them. If you're adversarial and combative and in taking those types of approaches, you're not going to get a lot of response out of your team. But if you really take a, from a cultural standpoint, a we're in this together and we want to push this over the finish line, that's going to get you further faster. But tactically, I'd look at the top five deals for every rep and I would strategize or ask them to strategize what opportunities do I need to get to that 10%. Um, I would be looking at my sales conversations that I'm having just very, very tactically how successful or unsuccessful are my sales conversations if I'm at this low conversion rate and even if I double it to 10 percent, that's a very tactical place in uh, an impactful place, I would argue, to be looking at skills. So if I'm an individual or I'm leading a team of SDRs. I would be looking at their sales conversations. How, how are they structuring them? How are they leading them? Uh, are they asking insightful, challenging questions? And how are they creating momentum from one conversation to the next? You can only be you can only expect to be included in conversations as a seller when you put forth the effort first. If you're waiting for those things to come to you, it's not going to happen. Not in today's day and age. So, so if it's an existing customer that I really want to target, I'm going to put some concerted effort into staying in front of the people that I know and finding other people to stay in front of my relationship ecosystem in that customer. If we're only talking to them once a year, don't expect to be looped in to their, their biggest problems and their, their biggest deals. You just haven't earned the right or the credibility to, to do that, in my opinion. Um, accountability is one of the biggest challenges that I see in any organization, sales organization or otherwise. Sometimes it's personal accountability. Sometimes it's holding someone accountable as the leader. So, so I certainly would not have an expectation that a brand new, brand new green SDR who does not have industry experience or sales experience would not put that on his or her shoulders. I would want to be creating an environment as a sales leader that helps them to learn and grow because if they have if they have the right skills and they have the mindset, 
that I want to have on my team, I want to keep them. And I want to create an environment where they can be successful and challenged that creates those results. Wonderful. That's a great note to end this chat. I, I really enjoyed uh, I really enjoyed talking because there is so much that we can still talk about. But Amy, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Subhanjan, thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. And finally, we have George Bronton, a lifelong entrepreneur with 20 years of experience in software space and a passion for sales and marketing. With the life motto, don't settle for mainstream, George is always looking for new ways to achieve improved business results using innovative software, skills and processes. He shares his thoughts on the award-winning blog, Art and Science of Complex Sales. Since 2012, George and his team at Membrane.com have collaborated with thought leaders and studied research to identify the success factors behind successful sales organizations. The result of their hard work is a software as a service that makes it easier for companies to capture, learn and execute the behaviors needed to achieve sales excellence. Who better than George to wrap up this session of fixing the 5% conversion problem in B2B sales. George. Welcome to the show. Yes. I'm delighted to have you here. So essentially, there is this elephant in the room in B2B sales, which somehow we are not talking or not talking enough about, mm -hmm. which is this abysmal lead to conversion rate that we are living with. I, I fully agree with you that from a sort of outside perspective on a leadership and a board level, it's, it's kind of weirdly accepted that sales is as inefficient and ineffective that it is. I agree. And sales and marketing, maybe you should say, because they go together. Absolutely. So what got us here? Yeah, this is a great question. And uh, given it a lot of thought, <laughs> uh, and I think in selling, I think if you don't know selling, if you don't really understand what selling is about, it's easy to believe or draw the conclusion and make the assumption that salespeople are somehow born, right? They're people that were born with a certain trait. We think of them as, you know, super extroverted, uh, very social uh, go-getters that won't take no for an answer. But if you have that assumption that that's how it is, well, you won't be spending any time and effort and money on developing salespeople. You just think they're out there and you need to recruit the ones, the superheroes, and they, they'll make it happen. But, but in real life, that's not how it is. It's a profession and you need to get skilled. You need to get good at it. You need to get trained. You need to get coached just like every other profession. When we talk about sales leadership, and you know, you've, you've been around, you know this as well. I mean, sometimes we make the mistake or the leaders of the company make the mistake of making their best salesperson into their sales manager or their sales leader. And that might be great if that person has the mentality and the mindset to become a great manager. But oftentimes you can make yourself, it can be a real disservice to your company because you're taking your best producer and if he or she does not have the mindset to be a good coach and help others succeed, but is really driven about uh, about, um, uh, driven uh, to pre uh, perform themselves, that will end up becoming a, a poor manager <laughs> or leader, and you just lost your best performer. Also, understanding who's the right leader at the right time for a company is also very important. Yes, because uh, you might. You might bring in a leader who did a great job for IBM, hmm. but putting that lead sales leader into a startup could be the, I mean, complete disaster. Um, so you have to also have the right leader at the right time, so to speak. So it's Absolutely. a timing issue as well. I think the disconnect is still that we are pretty compartmental. Like marketing is doing their thing to generate leads and then sales do their thing and then customer success do their thing. I think we have to look at it more from the buyer's perspective. Uh, like how do, if I'm a buyer and I make contact, how is my experience from the first contact with the company to becoming a customer and hopefully becoming an ambassador for the company and the product? And uh, 
your voice, the company voice, is it the same from the beginning? And, or, or is the customer success using a whole other type of language mm. than the marketing did? So having this as a coherent uh, theme throughout the entire experience, I, that's where I think we need to spend more time and there's often a disconnect. I think also in marketing, we are often looking for the quick quick fix. Like if we send out this email to hundreds of thousands of people, we get these many leads and we, we, we look at the conversion rates, et cetera. And that's fine. We should do campaigns and then it's brand awareness and all that. Uh, but we need to be, I think most B2B companies need to be a bit more specific in, in uh, who to go after and do a really solid job in segmenting their market, defining their ideal customer fit, understanding their stakeholders, all the problems aligning with that, et cetera. So, so I think we, we need to not l seek sort of the easy fix and, and try to just copy someone else's uh, methodology off the bat because they've made a fantastic uh, result out of it. But, but really focus on where are we, where do we want to go, who's our customer, what can we help them with, How's that different from the competitor? What's our differentiator in the market? How do we communicate that? How do we look at this from a buyer's perspective to be sort of yeah, consistent throughout the entire journey? And with a long-term view. And the long-term view, I think, what messed that up is our, our I mean, the, the entire quarterly-based society we live yes. in. We have, I mean, the, it's, it's structured in a way that we have to get the quick wins. And the salespeople have to say, oh, if you buy today, I'm going to give you the discount, but not tomorrow. It's like, okay, so you just told the person that in a quarter's time, you can get an even better deal. <laughs> so it's just, we, we have to stop being so short, uh, yeah. have such a short time frame in front of our eyes all the time. But, it, but it's hard. I, I get that yeah. also because you need to show the results to the investors and the owners if you're in that, if you're in that hamster wheel, so to speak. Yeah, that's where possibly the role of the sales leadership comes in, which can sell to the management and the board the need for a long-term view for a sustainable business. In companies where you have that strong vision and you have a strong purpose, I think you see a, a much higher engagement, much more motivation uh, among their, their staff to actually do what's, what's needed. And that's the that's the difficulty as a leader, I think, to come up with that vision, that strategy, and, and get everyone to see it and buy in uh, on that and, and, and be wanting to be a part of that journey. I believe that leaders of companies uh, need to um, see that elephant in the room like, okay, we're looking at sales, and it's almost like a black box for many, many boards like yeah we see here sales but we look at the forecast and it, it was way off last quarter it's going to be mm -hmm. way off now but why why is it fire the sales leader you know you have to look at it in, an, in a new way like this is um, this sales is a profession sales needs to be done in a professional way uh, and it needs to be aligned with the strategy of the company and we need to have we need to invest in our sales leaders and our frontline sales manager uh, managers and our salespeople and marketing and customer success, and it all needs to stick together. So, I mean, having this holistic perspective um, is, is really key and, and making sure that we give the sales leaders what they need. I think that's the next problem because we mm -hmm. sometimes they just get a number. Like, okay, this is the number, make the number. Okay, but then I need, you know, training, I need tools, I need this, well, Maybe if you reach a number, <laughs> they don't always get the resources. Yeah. Uh, and 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 also the it, within sales you have, I mean we're look, seeing a lot more specialization. Uh, so that it might be that some of the some of those tasks uh, is suitable to be on a commission, whereas others are not. Yeah, but I find it to be a very difficult, uh, very difficult. Um, balancing act because you are competing with other companies who might be doing it wrong so if you start doing it right mm, okay will it be perceived as right or will it just be perceived as as crazy what according to you are the things that tech companies SaaS companies you can take any any slice of it that you're comfortable with and say what are the things that they can do which will move the needle from a single digit 
to at least a double digit conversion yeah yeah i i talk a lot about just m making sure you're doing the basics the fundamentals of selling right you need to understand who your customer is. You need to understand how you create value for them. You need to understand who you need to talk to, like the stakeholders. I, I think, and I'm, I've been repeating this so many times, but sellers often repeat the mistake of just talking to one stakeholder and believing and hoping and praying that this person is gonna sell you your solution internally to the, to the team. And this is where I mean that structure needs to be in place to make sure that we are always targeting the right customer. We know the value. We talk to the right people about the right things at the right time. We follow up when we say we should follow up. It's not that complex, actually, but but it's hard to do it consistently. And maybe a last a last thing to throw in there to get to a double digit is be more proactive in which customers you want to get because if, you, if you're looking at it from from a sort of a macro level yes five percent from what where did we count the five percent was it the number of marketed qualified leads or was it the number of of opportunities we actually put in the pipeline there's a lot of i don't know confusion about the kpis what what kpi means what everyone is measuring differently the funnel to me is more of a marketing concept. Like hmm. we, the marketing department, put stuff in a funnel and then it trickles down and we see very little come out. Every time I, if I lose a, a, a pipeline, the bad thing with the pipeline is it, it sounds like uh, everything go, that goes in comes out. And and that would be great. Like that's our ambition. We get 100% come yeah. out, but, but it's leaky, right? So something, is, yeah. there will always be deals that you will not, win i never use the word lose yeah. because i think we don't lose uh clients we just they just decided to do something else right now true they didn't buy from you but that doesn't mean that they will never buy from you they might true. buy from you in a year from now or two years from now so true. don't don't think of it as lost because then you will your head is like okay i lost them and yeah. it will be painful to pick that up again instead you say oh, i'll just archive them uh, another thing with the funnel that I dislike, it's, it's almost like gravity will pull them through. <laughs> and if that was the case, you don't need salespeople, right? And in True. some business, in some businesses, you don't need salespeople. And then that, True. that's also, I mean, that's a good bit, can be a good business. But if you're in a complex B2B sales environment, you will need salespeople yes. that will need to engage with people at your buyers and provide value and help them see what they need to see. Absolutely, George. This was a great conversation. Thank you very much. I really appreciate and uh, and we'll talk soon. Yeah, thank you very much. Tune in next week to meet Bill McCormick, Chief Sales Officer at Social Sales Link, Paula White, President Side B Consultant, and Ben Pincus, Practice Lead, Sales Strategy at Scaled Consulting and get a peek into what they're thinking about this elephant in the sales room. We have to earn the right to have a sales conversation with someone, all right? And one of the ways we do that is we always have to keep in mind the ask-offer ratio, all right? Keenan in his book, Gap Selling, talks about this, that there's always an ask-offer ratio. If you're asking someone to read an email, you're asking them to, to look at your LinkedIn profile or read a message you've sent or read a piece of content, we're asking them for their time, which is their most valuable possession. We have to make sure they get something in return that's of equal or lesser or, or more value than, than that. Well, I think because of bots and I think because of where we are, you know, Alexa can only give information and they're transactional. But if we're going to be a consultative selling where we actually become partners with business to business, then that's where we need to grow to we need to get above the bots doing those things because that just makes it very transactional give 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 before you ask and so the way that the way that we teach and the way that you know we talk about this is connect with someone engage with the content that they put out on linkedin create content yourself that it just is designed for the people that are going to buy from you not to tell them hey here's this thing that i do it's if you're a leader in this industry, here are things you should be thinking about. 
show that you understand what they're going through. And so that by the time you really send that direct message, ask for that meeting, you know, they already know who you are. They already have a little bit of understanding. And as I was saying earlier, they've already done their research on you anyway, but they've done it in a way that you've controlled a little bit. I'm very excited about this series. My guests certainly were, and I can't wait to hear from you. What do you think about this elephant in the sales room? Please use the link below to record your views in video, and we will start incorporating them into the show in the following episodes. Time to wrap up for today. Remember, you will soon have access to the complete interviews and transcripts. Keep an eye out for the link in the EXO newsletter. And thank you for watching. Until next time, stay well and craft extraordinary outcomes. Mm -hmm.